بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب الأقضية The Book of Judicial Decisions The first chapter talks about the oath being on the one against whom the claim is made From Ibn Abbas the Prophet said لو يعطى الناس بدعواهم لدعى ناس دماء رجال وأموالهم ولكن اليمين على المدعى عليه If people could be given in accordance with their claims then people would claim the blood of others and their wealth but the oath is upon the one against whom the claim is made that is the defendant first let's deal with a few technical words we have the word ash-shahada translated to testimony which is a person informing about the rights of one person against another we have an iqrar a confession which is when a person informs about the rights against his own self and we have al-qada meaning a judgment which is when the qadi the judge explains to us the hukum shar'i, the sharia ruling, and enforces it. So he has the power of the state. And then we have an ifta, which is to give a fatwa. This is when the mufti explains to us or makes plain to us the hukum shar'i, but he is unable to enforce it. So note these technical terms and the differences between them. As for this hadith, it is telling us that if anyone makes a claim against another, then he has to provide evidence because the asal is that nobody owes anyone anything. So anyone who makes a claim is going against the asal, meaning going against the default ruling. And anyone who goes against the default ruling or the asal, that is the status quo, then he has to provide the evidence. The one making the claim has to provide the evidence. However, sometimes we can have circumstantial evidences and indications which strengthen the side of the one who's making the claim. For example, a woman is claiming that the jewellery in the hand of a man belongs to her. Now, men do not normally wear jewellery. Women do. So here we have a strong qarina or an indication that her claim is correct. So even if she has not provided us with evidence, we can still accept her claim because of circumstantial evidence or indications. However, in a case like this, because her side is strengthened due to the circumstantial evidence, she has to take the oath that this belongs to her and then she can claim it. So note that this idea of the one who makes a claim must provide the evidence and the other one, the defendant, gives the oath. This is not a hard and fast rule. There are exceptions to it. And sometimes it can be the other way around. Because the one who's making a claim, his side can be stronger. Generally what we say is that the one who takes an oath is the person whose side is stronger. Let's look at the next chapter about making a qada using one witness and an oath. From Ibn Abbas, he says that the Prophet made a qada, made a judgment using an oath and a witness. Normally in matters of wealth, you need two witnesses who are male and just. However, if the claimant brings only one male just witness, then this does not suffice as an evidence, as a bayyana but it does make his side stronger and remember what we said the one whose side is stronger he takes the oath so in a case like this the claimant can now take the oath and he will be entitled to what he is claiming and this is similar to the al qasama which you'll remember which is taking the 50 oaths it is taken by the claimant not by the defendant and the reason is because we have a qarina or circumstantial evidence which strengthens the claimant's case so when it comes to financial matters, you can bring two just male witnesses or you can bring one man and two women to replace that second man or you could bring one man but with the claimant also taking an oath. And of course you have the fourth way which is iqrar. A person confesses against himself that he owes somebody else money or whatever else it may be. Okay, so here's a question. What about if he brings two women witnesses and the claimant takes an oath. Here the ulama have differed. Some have said yes. They've said in all cases where you require a male witness, you can have two female witnesses taking his place. So in financial matters, if you require two male witnesses, then you can have four women witnesses. They take the evidence from the generality of the hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ told the women, يَا مَعَشَرَ النِّسَاءَ تَصَدَّقْنَا وَأَكْثِرْنَا لِاسْتِغْفَارِ فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ كُنَّا أَكْثَرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ A woman give charity and make more istighfar because I have seen you to be most of the people of the fire. One woman said, وَمَا لَنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَكْثَرُ أَهْلِ النَّارِ How is this, O Messenger of Allah? And he says, تُكْثِرْنَا اللَّعَنْ وَتَكْفُرْنَا الْعَشِيرِ That the woman curses much and she is ungrateful for the good treatment from her husband. He says, مَا رَأَيْتُ مِنْ نَا قِسَاتِ أَقْلٍ وَدِينٍ 
أَغْلَبَ لِذِي لُبٍ مِنْكُنْ I have not seen anyone with a deficient intellect and deen to take away the intellect of a person of sound intellect than you. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, ma nuqsanul aql wa deen? And she asked, What is this deficiency in the intellect and deen? The Prophet said, Amma nuqsanul aql, fa shahadatu mara'ataini ta'adilu shahadata rajul. As for the deficiency in the intellect, then two women witnesses equal to one man witness. Fa hadha nuqsanul aql. So this is the deficiency in the intellect. And he says, وَتَمْكُثُ الْلَيَالِ مَا تُصَلِّي وَتُفْثِرُ فِي رَمَضَانِ فَهَذَا نُقْسَانُ الدِّينَ She spends many nights not praying and she breaks the fast in Ramadan. That is the deficiency in the deen. So the shahid from the hadith that two witnessing from women is equal to one male witness. As for the other opinion held by the Hanbali madhab, they say no, this will not suffice. Two women and a witness from the claimant does not suffice. And neither do four women in lieu of two men. As for the hudud punishment, then you have four witnessing of the men for zina and adultery, two witnesses for theft, four witnesses for qadhaf. Some scholars will say that four men can equal eight women and then two men can equal four women. Others will say no, we will stick to the text and there is no place for women when it comes to had punishment. However, when it comes to theft, we realize that there is a had punishment at stake, which is the hand cutting off, but also it is a financial matter. Therefore, if somebody is claiming that another person stole from him and he brings one man and two women in lieu of the second man, then the had punishment cannot be established, according to the Hanbali Madhab at least. But what can be established is that the wealth needs to be returned. Because remember, in a financial situation, you are allowed one man and two women to establish your rights if you are the claimant. So yes, he has to give back the wealth which you claim he stole because you have provided sufficient evidence for that. But you have not provided sufficient evidence for the hand to be cut off. One might ask, but if women can be used for financial matters, then why can women not be used for had punishment matters? Well, firstly, the answer is because we follow the text and there's no textual evidence for that. But then another backup reason would be that when it comes to had punishments, we have to try to avoid these had punishments if there is any doubt. And because the claimant cannot bring sufficient male witnesses, that then creates sufficient doubt so as to avoid the had punishment. Let's move to the next chapter about eloquence in giving your argument. From Umm Salama, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّكُمْ تَخْتَصِمُونَ إِلَيَّ وَلَعَلَّ بَعْضَكُمْ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَلْحَنَا بِحُجَّتِهِ مِنْ بَعْضٍ فَأَقْضِ لَهُ عَلَى نَحْوِ مِمَّا أَسْمَعُوا مِنْهِ فَمَنْ قَطَعْتُ لَهُ مِنْ حَقِّ أَخِيهِ شَيْئًا فَلَا يَأْخُذْهُ فَإِنَّمَا أَقْطَعُ لَهُ بِهِ قِطَعَةً مِنَ النَّارِ You people come to me with your disputes and some are more eloquent at arguing than others so I will decide in favor of the eloquent argument. So, if I give to any one of you something which in reality belongs to your brother, then you must not take it because I have only given to him a piece of the fire. We take from this hadith that the Prophet does not know the unseen because if he did, it will not be possible for him to make a mistake. Yet we find by the Prophet's own admission in this hadith that it is possible for the Prophet to make mistakes in judging between people. Yet there is no sin on the one who gives the wrong decision as long as he made ijtihad. We find in Surah Al-A'raf, he says, وَلَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ لَاسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَّنِيَ السُّوءُ If I knew the unseen, I would gather up much goodness and wealth, and no harm would ever touch me. And that's obvious, because if you know the unseen, then you will know what harm is coming your way, and you will take the necessary precaution. This hadith is an evidence that you're allowed to take a lawyer for yourself, because you may not be eloquent in putting forward your case, but a lawyer who is qualified in this field will be eloquent. So you can take a lawyer because the judge is going to judge in accordance with what he hears. So have somebody eloquent and knowledgeable defending you. As far as the lawyer is concerned, then he is not allowed to defend anyone whom he knows to be upon the batil or is a wrongdoer because you're not allowed to help in sin and transgression. We take a profound point from the hadith. The qadi must judge in accordance with what he hears in the case, not in accordance with what he knows from his background knowledge. So for example, the Qadi knows that Amr owes Zayd a hundred pounds and Zayd 
brings Amr to court. He's claiming that Amr owes him £100. The Qadi, from some previous background knowledge, knows that Amr owes Zayd £100. However, the problem is that Zayd cannot provide sufficient evidence for his claim. So how does the Qadi judge? Does he judge in accordance with what he knows from his background knowledge? Or does he judge in accordance with the evidence provided to him in a court of law? The answer is the latter. So we could have a case where the judge knows that in actuality he is giving the wrong ruling, yet he has to stick to the letter of the law and judge in accordance with what is presented to him in the court of law. But we witness here a manifest problem. The Qadi is judging with what he knows to be wrong. Is there a solution to this? The ulama have suggested a solution. They've said that the Qadi must refrain from being a Qadi in this particular case and he must refer the two disputants to another Qadi, a second Qadi, and this first Qadi will stand in as a witness. He will witness that Amr owes Zayd £100. So this is a solution. However, if we allow a Qadi to judge in accordance with the background knowledge which he has, then the matter will all become corrupted. The due process will lose all its value. The due process meaning that you present evidence and you give a ruling in accordance with the evidence presented. This is the due process. It will lose all its value and meaning if we simply allow the Qadi to judge in accordance with his background personal knowledge. And such a matter will also cast doubts on the Qadi that he is not ruling in accordance with the evidence that we can all see. So what is the matter with this Qadi now? And perhaps the Qadi is showing favoritism. These are the mafasid or the corruptions that will ensue if we allow the Qadi to judge in accordance with his knowledge. However, there are exceptions. Three in total, which we'll mention. The first one, if the claimant brings some witnesses, we obviously have to verify that these witnesses are trustworthy, other. You cannot just have any old witness in the court. However, the Qadi may have background knowledge that these particular witnesses are trustworthy and he can judge in accordance with that. That is to say, he can accept them in the court of law. So the Qadi here does not need to say, bring somebody who would give these witnesses tazkiyah. Note that in this case, the Qadi is not giving a decision on the court case using his personal knowledge. No, rather, he is just accepting these witnesses into the court of law using his personal knowledge. That is completely different to actually giving a judgment on the case at hand. The second exception is to say that the Qadi can judge in accordance with his personal knowledge which he has gained in the court of law. So for example, yesterday Zayd acknowledged that he owes Khalid £100 in court, yet today, standing in front of and opposing Khalid, Zayd is now denying it. So the Qadi here can use his personal knowledge which he gained in the court of law, that was from yesterday, to judge against Zayd. So note that this personal knowledge of the Qadi was gained in the court of law. The third exception is when a matter becomes so widely well known that it becomes personal knowledge of everyone. The Qadi can use this personal knowledge to judge. For example, it is well known in the city that a particular house belongs to Zayd. Zayd leases his house to Amr. Now Amr is claiming that this house belongs to him. The Qadi here can judge using his personal knowledge that the house belongs to Zayd. Why? Because it is well known all throughout the city that this particular famous house belongs to Zayd. And the reason why he can do that is because there will be no tuhma or blame or suspicion cast on the Qadi that he is showing favoritism. Other than these three exceptions, the Qadi must give a judgment in accordance with what is presented before him in his court. We also take a vital lesson. If the Qadi judges in your favour, something which you know does not belong to you, then the judgment stands effective. However, this will not save you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You are not allowed to say to Allah Jalla wa'ala that the Qadi judged in my favour, therefore it is halal for me. It is not halal for you, as we clearly find in the Hadith. So the Hukum is Sahih on the outside, fil zahir, but it is not Sahih fil batin, in the inner affairs, and it will not save you from the punishment. Let's move to the next chapter about the case of Hind. Aisha reports that Hind bint Utbah, the wife of Abu Sufyan, came and said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Inna Aba Sufyan rajulun shahih, la yu'atini min al-nafaqati ma yakfini wa yakfi bani, illa ma akhadtu min malihi bi ghayri ilmih, fahal alayya fi thalika min junah. She said, O Messenger of Allah, Abu Sufyan, 
is a stingy person. He does not give me enough expenditure that will suffice me and my children, except that which I take from his wealth without his knowledge. Is there any sin upon me in that? The Prophet replied, خُذِي مِنْ مَالِهِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ مَا يَكْفِيكِ وَيَكْفِي بَنِيكِ Take from his wealth on a reasonable basis that which will suffice you and your children. Plenty of interesting points from this hadith. Firstly, it is permissible for a woman to use the name of her husband. She says, Abu Sufyan, that's Kunya. Likewise, she can call her husband using his name as well, and vice versa. Secondly, we pick up that backbiting is not backbiting if it is done for a genuine need. Heya Hind is complaining about her rights not being respected. Backbiting, or ghiba, is when you speak about somebody that which he does not like without there being a particular need to do so. And we're talking about a genuine shari'i need. The Prophet ﷺ did something similar himself with Fatima bint Qais when he was giving her advice. He said, Muawiyah is a rajulun su'luk la malala. Muawiyah is a poor person, he has no wealth, so do not marry him. And then Abu Jaham, la yada'u asahu an atiqih. He does not take a stick off his shoulder, meaning he beats his women, so do not marry him. Wankahi Usama ibn Zayd, but marry Usama ibn Zayd. So the Prophet spoke negatively of two men, and this is not backbiting. We take from the narration that it is obligatory upon the husband to spend on his wife and children, because the Prophet acknowledged what Hind said. A big question comes here. Is the Prophet judging against Abu Sufyan without hearing his side of the story? The answer is no. This is not a qada, rather it is a fatwa. Remember what we said, the qada is enforced, whereas a fatwa cannot be enforced. And a fatwa can be given about somebody in his absence, but not a qada. Now you'll notice that this hadith comes in the kitab al-qada, as if Imam Muslim believes this decision to be a qada, and we would respectfully disagree. And this hadith is an evidence of the, what they call, mas'alatu al-dhafar which is when you take your right from someone who owes it to you without their knowledge, such as in this case, and such as in the case where a guest takes the food of his host without the host knowing if the host is not providing him. Why? Because these rights are well known, as opposed to if somebody owes you £100, can you take this £100 from him without his knowing? The answer is no. Why? Because even though you do have a right against him, but this right is not well known. So note the difference. Let's take the next chapter about asking too many questions and wasting wealth from al mughirat ibn Shu'bah. The Prophet said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ عُقُوقَ الْأُمَّهَاتِ وَوَأْدَ الْبَنَاتِ وَمَنْ عَنْ وَهَاتِ وَكَرِهَ لَكُمْ ثَلَاثًا قِيلَ وَقَالْ وَكَثْرَةَ السُّؤَالِ وَإِضَاعَةَ الْمَالِ Allah Azza wa Jal makes haram for you disobedience of your mothers, burying your daughters, withholding the rights of others and demanding from others that which you have no right to. And he hates for you three things, hot gossip, asking too many unnecessary questions and wasting wealth. So as for this qila wa qal, the hot gossiping, this is bloat speech which does not benefit anyone. And it could also mean conveying a message without checking if it is authentic or not. So it's just narrating everything you hear. He says, uququl ummahat Uquq from aq, meaning al-qata, to cut. This is when you cut off yourself from obedience to your mother. But what about the obedience of the father? It is not mentioned in this hadith. And the reason for that is because a child may fear the father, but he may not have fear of the mother. So disobedience of the mother may be trivial in the eyes of the son or the daughter. So that is why the mother is given a special mention. Otherwise, the same rule applies to the father as well. And he mentions wa'dul banat, burying your daughters alive. He does not mention the sons. But of course, the same ruling applies to the sons. It's just that he mentions daughters because this is what would happen most often. As for asking many questions, then of course you are allowed to ask questions if there is a genuine need to do so. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ As Allah Jalla wa'ala says. However, what is intended in this hadith is to ask questions for which there is no particular need and it does not serve a worthwhile purpose. As for the idha'atul mal, wasting wealth, then it is when you spend on anything that will anger Allah Jalla wa'ala or annoy him. So do not be a spendthrift, one who spends needlessly, because these are the brothers of the shayateen. إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ Now you are allowed to buy luxury items for yourself, food, decoration, so on, 
However, going to extremes and doing it excessively is wasting wealth. Take note of an interesting point from this hadith. In the first part of the hadith, he says, "Inna Allah Azza wa Jalla harrama alaykum." Allah makes haram for you. And in the second part of the hadith, he says, "Wa kariha lakum thalathan," and he hates for you three things. Now, that does not mean that the qila wa qal wa kathra al sual wa idaat al mal are makru because Allah hates it for you. No, rather these are haram. And so whatever Allah Jalla wa Ala hates for you is haram. Now in a narration of the same chapter, when Muawiyah was the Khalifa, he wrote to Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah asking about a hadith which Al-Mughira had heard. And Al-Mughira narrated this hadith to Muawiyah. And this is particularly relevant because during the time of Muawiyah's Khilafah, there were many Khawarij who hated him and wanted him out of power. And they obviously tried to defame him. So Al-Mughira told him this hadith about the qila wa qal, the hot gossiping, so that Muawiyah does not involve himself with what was said and what is said in the society, because a lot of people are trying to defame him, and Muawiyah has no need of hearing about these lies against him, likewise with asking many questions. And the same thing with wasting wealth, because the Khalifa has access to wealth, and if he's not careful, he may end up wasting it. Note also that the word uquq comes from aq, which means to cut, as in to cut something. And so the uquq of your parents would be cutting off good treatment of your parents and doing that which will annoy them or harm them and also disobeying them in all that which is right and proper. And it must be known that uquq al-walidayn is a major sin, not a minor one. Also, with the kathrat al-su'al, it has two meanings. First could be asking questions about the deen. Now this is wrong if you're asking hyper-theoretical questions to a mufti. The questions you ask to a mufti for a fatwa should be practical, relevant matters. Matters which have either occurred or are extremely likely to occur in the near future. You can go into hyper theory in the context of a study circle when you're exploring ideas. That's a different context. But as for if you go up to a mufti seeking an answer, then it needs to be based on practical, real life problems not hyper theory. And the second way to understand kathrat al-su'al is asking people of their wealth. And this should not be done except if you are in the category of those for whom it is permissible to ask. But as far as you can help it, do not ask anyone for anything. Even asking them to make dua for you, try to refrain from that. The Prophet would ask his companions to give a pledge of allegiance agreeing that they will not ask anyone for anything, such that even if a whip were to fall down, they would get off their horse and pick it up and not ask anyone else to pick it up for them, even though that would have been easier. The next chapter about the Hakim receiving two rewards if he arrives at the right answer and one reward if he does not. From Amr ibn al-As that the Prophet said, إِذَا حَكَمَ الْحَاكِمُ فَاجْتَهَدَ ثُمَّ أَصَابَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا وَإِذَا حَكَمَ فَاجْتَهَدَ ثُمَّ أَخْطَأَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا When a hakim makes his ishtihad and arrives at the right answer, he has two rewards. If he, however, makes his judgment, makes his ishtihad, but arrives at the wrong answer, then he has one reward. From this hadith, we learn of the grace of Allah Jalla wa Ala on the mujtahideen and the hukam, that whatever their decision is, as long as they have tried their best and they have strived to gain the right answer and they have feared Allah Jalla wa Ala, not seeking the easiest opinion, not seeking the opinion that will make the people happy, not seeking the opinion that will make the rulers happy, but rather only seeking the opinion that will make Allah Jalla wa Ala happy, as long as they have done this, then they cannot lose whether they get the right answer or wrong. And when he says, إِذَا hakam al hakim, this word hakim includes the Qadi and the Mufti. Note also that if he arrives at the wrong answer, he is not punished for it. However, note the condition of the ishtihad. This is what the Prophet says, فَاشْتَهَدَ And he makes the ishtihad. So, if a person is not from Ahlul Ishtihad, not qualified to make ishtihad, then this hadith does not apply to him. He is not allowed to give a ruling. He is not allowed to try to make ishtihad. Rather, his job is to refer to the people of ishtihad. Also, if a person is from the people of ishtihad, so he's qualified to do that, meaning to say make ishtihad, but he does not and just gives a haphazard ruling, then this hadith also does not apply to him. 
This hadith applies to the one who is capable of making ijtihad and he does so. So the two rewards are one for his ijtihad and one for the right answer. As for if he gets the wrong answer, then he has the reward for his ijtihad but no reward for the wrong answer. We also take a vital lesson from this hadith that if two scholars differ on a matter, then both of them cannot be correct at the same time. At best, one can be correct, but both cannot be correct. And some people hold the misguided opinion that just because the madhahib differ, they are all correct. No, they are not all correct. Only one is correct. Our job is to find which one that is, if we are able to do so. If not, then we can make taqlid. If every ishtihad of a scholar was correct, then this hadith would have no meaning to it. Let's move to the next chapter about judging when you are angry from Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr. He says, my father dictated and I wrote to Ubaidullah ibn Abi Bakr when he was the Qadi in Sijistan that the Prophet said, لا يحكم أحد بين اثنين وهو غضبان one of you should not judge between two people whilst he is angry. Anger, especially deep anger, clouds your judgment. And so you will not be able to picture the court case the way it should be. And then you will not be able to picture the ruling you are given the way you should be picturing it. And you will not be able to implement the ruling on that particular court case the way it should be implemented. So these are three corruptions. If, however, his anger is a light anger, which does not cloud the judgment, so it's more of an annoyance, then you are allowed to give a ruling. And the evidence for this is in the Sahih, where Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam had a dispute with a man from the Ansar about some water that was running. The Ansari wanted the water to come to him first, Az-Zubayr wanted it to come to him first, so that they could water their dead palm trees. And the Prophet judged, Isqi ya Zubair, thumma arsil ila jarik. O Zubair, you water your date palm trees and then let it run to your neighbor, meaning that Ansari. The Ansari became angry and he said, Ankana ibn Ammatik. He only gave this ruling because he is the son of your paternal aunt, meaning Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. The Prophet became angry at this because this Ansari is accusing the Prophet of nepotism when it comes to ahkam and judgment. And nepotism is anathema to Allah Jalla wa ala. And so the Prophet punished this Ansari by saying, Isqi thumma habis hatta yablu jadr. Water your date palm trees, O Zubair, and then keep hold of the water until it returns back to where it came from. That is to say, do not let it run through to your neighbor. And as Zubair ibn al-Awwam says that he believes that it was in relation to this incident, the ayah came down, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Nay, by your Rabb, they will not have Iman until they make you the judge in the disputes between them. And furthermore, they must not even find in themselves any problem with what you have judged and that they must completely submit to your ruling. So the point is the Prophet is giving a judgment here whilst he is angry. The hadith says that even the color of his face changed. However, it is not the type of anger which will cloud your judgment. We ask a question, if a judge gives a judgment whilst he is in a state of extreme anger, is this judgment in effect? The answer is no, because its presence will be like its absence. Why? because the Prophet has directly forbidden it. The second question is, can we make an analogy? The answer is most certainly yes. Any state that the Qadi may be in which will cloud his judgment, then he is not allowed to give a ruling. So he may be in a case of extreme heat or extreme cold or extreme hunger or thirst and so on. The next chapter talks about rejecting innovation. From Aisha, the Prophet said, Man ahdatha fi amrina ma laysa minhu fahwarad. Whoever innovates something new, that which is not from our matter, that is the deen of Islam, then it is rejected. Actually, this hadith ties in nicely with the previous one where we asked the question, is his judgment effective? And if the judge judges when he is in a fit of rage, then he has done something not in accordance with this matter of ours, and hence it is to be rejected because every time you do something which the Prophet has 
explicitly forbidden, then it is not from the matter of ours, and it is to be rejected. That is, its presence is like its absence. Another wording in the same chapter, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuarad. And it basically has the same meaning. From this hadith we find that the default ruling in ibadat is that they are all forbidden and all to be rejected except that which you have evidence for. Or every time you make halal into haram or haram into halal, it is to be rejected. So this hadith looks at our outward actions. If we combine it with the other hadith of Umar radiallahu an, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intention. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى And every person will have what he intends. Then that hadith deals with the actions of the heart because your intention is in the heart. So both of these hadith are pivotal. One deals with the outward actions and the other deals with the inward action of intention. Let's take the next chapter about the best of witnesses from Zayd ibn Khalid al-Juhani that the Prophet said أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِخَيْرِ الشُّهَدَاءِ الَّذِي يَأْتِي بِشَهَادَتِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُسْأَلَهَا Should I not inform you of the best of the witnesses? He is the one who comes with his testimony before he is asked to do so. This hadith on the surface does seem to clash with the other authentic hadith. خَيْرُكُمْ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يُلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يُلُونَهُمْ the best nations are the first three nations. ثُمَّ يَكُونُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ قَوْمٌ يَخُونُونَ وَلَا يُؤْتَمَنُونَ Then they will come after them people who will be treacherous and they cannot be entrusted. وَيَشْهَدُونَ وَلَا يُسْتَشْهَدُونَ They will testify, yet they will not ask to testify. وَيَظْهَرُ فِيهِمُ السِّمَنْ And fatness will appear amongst them because of their luxury living. So look then, he says, they will testify whilst they were not asked to do so. So the second narration which we have narrated is in the context of blaming or rebuking them so a negative context so the way to resolve this would be to say that in the hadith of the chapter these are trustworthy witnesses and as for the hadith of the blameworthy context then they are untrustworthy witnesses they give false testimony and also we can say that with the hadith in this chapter these are people who bring the testimony before they are asked to do so because they are witnesses yet the one who is claiming the right has not asked them to testify because he does not know that they are witnesses. And if they did not testify, then the claimant's rights will be lost. So this is why they come to testify, so that the claimant's rights are not lost. And that is a praiseworthy action. Let's look at the next chapter about the difference between people who make ishtihad. Abu Hurairah reports that the Prophet ﷺ said that two women had been going along with their two sons and a wolf came and took away a child from one of them. So one child was left remaining, and both women claimed that this was her child. So they took the dispute to Dawud and he judged in favor of the older woman. And they took the case to Sulaiman and he said, bring me a sikkin, a knife, and I will cut this child in two, and you can each take half. To this the younger woman replied, no, it cannot be, may Allah have mercy on you. This child belongs to the other woman. And to this, Sulaiman gave the child to her. And Abu Huraira says, commenting on this hadith, that this was the first time that he heard of this word, a sikkin, meaning a knife, because they used to call it al-mudiya. Da'ud made his ijtihad in favor of the older woman because she may be better and more experienced at looking after the child, and perhaps less likely to have another child, seeing as though she is older. But Sulaiman he was clever, and he used an imaginative way to draw out the truth. And from this hadith we can prove that it is permissible to use qara'in or indications to judge. Because even though the claimants did not have any evidence for their own selves, but we did have an indication which suggests to us that the child belongs to the younger woman. Let's move to the last hadith of this book, a hakim bringing about reconciliation between the two disputants. From Abu Huraira, that the Prophet said, that a man bought a piece of land from another, and he found in this land some earthenware which contained gold. So he said to the seller, I bought the land from you, I did not buy anything which is buried in the land, so the gold belongs to you. And the seller said, no, you bought the land and everything in it, so the gold belongs to you. So they referred their matter to a judge, and the judge asked, do you have children? One man said, yes, I have a son, and the other man said, yes, I have a daughter. So the judge says, why don't you marry your son to his daughter and spend something of this gold on yourselves and give charity? Indeed, in this hadith, there is a great musalaha, reconciliation between two people. However, we're still left with the question, whom does the gold belong to? 
And the answer is the gold belongs to the seller in a case like this. Because if you buy a piece of land, then anything which is separate from this piece of land, such as buried gold or anything else, is not included with the land. However, anything which is connected to the land, such as trees or walls or buildings, then this is included with the land. It's the same thing if you buy a house. Anything connected to the walls of the house is part of the house. But anything which is separate from the house, such as a bed, for example, or a sofa, then this is not part of the house. We take from the hadith that to make sulh or reconciliation is recommended and reward worthy as long as it does not entail anything haram. So here this man will have the son marry the other's daughter. So they will all become one family. And so the gold will belong to all of them because they've become one family in terms of being in-laws. Okay, here's a question. If two judges differ, or let's say two scholars differ in their fatwa, then whom should you follow? Well, the first port of call is that you decide which evidence seems the weightier. Maybe one opinion is based on stronger evidence than the other. If you're able to decide, go ahead and do so. If you are unable to decide, then follow the scholar you trust most and you believe has the more praiseworthy credentials. Because in a case like this, this is the best you can do and you will not be blamed for following the best that you can do. Also, in the hadith of the innovation, we may say that anything which is prohibited, then if it is a contract, the contract is not in effect. For example, a riba we trade, that is directly prohibited. So this trade would not be in effect, meaning its presence would be like its absence. In other words, the goods must be returned. Similarly, marrying your sister. This is expressly forbidden and therefore this contract would not go ahead. So its presence is like its absence. You can call it a marriage all you want. It would not be recognized as a marriage. Now in the story of the judgment of Dawood it says that these two women went to Sulaiman Now this is not because they were not happy with the decision of Dawood but rather in another riwayah it says they passed by Sulaiman and Sulaiman asked them how did his father judge and they told him about the judgment to which Sulaiman replied bring the knife and the story goes on as you have heard. One might ask here did Sulaiman oppose his father because when the judge gives a decision it is not permissible for anyone to oppose the decision. The answer is what Sulaiman is doing is not directly opposing the decision of his father as such, but rather he is trying to expose the inner secrets and the inner truth of the matter. One of these women is definitely lying and he wants to expose the liar. And he did that using the knife trick. Of course, he did not intend to split the child in half physically. But this was a ploy that he used, a hila, to uncover the truth about the liar, who happened to be the elder woman, of course. Okay, another point to note. From the last hadith, we find the two men, the vendor and the purchaser, who have this, who have this dispute about whom the gold belongs to, they go to a third person who judges between them. So is this permissible then? If two people have a dispute, can they go to a third person to judge between them? And the answer is yes. This hadith forms an evidence that if both parties are happy to go to a third person to decide between them in these civil disputes, then the decision is binding on both parties because they were both happy to go to this third person. We also have the narration of Abu Shuraih who was called Abu al-Hakam because he used to decide between people and resolve their disputes and both parties would be happy. So they called him Abu al-Hakam and the Prophet changed it to Abu Shuraih. Shuraih being the man's eldest son. And it should be noted that if this were to happen and the third party, the judge, begins to decide, then none of the two disputants is allowed to turn back. Meaning to say, they're not allowed to say, Oh, I do not want this person to judge anymore. Once you've entered into this matter with your own consent, then you're not allowed to turn back.
And the reason we say this is because if one of the parties feels that the judgment is going to go against him, he will simply turn back and say, oh, I do not agree to this arbitration anymore. And it opens up the doors for people of desire. Okay, at this stage, let's take some review questions. So question number one, what is the difference between a qada and a fatwa? Question number two, we said that it is permissible for you to employ a lawyer to argue on your behalf. What would be the evidence for this opinion? Question number three, are you allowed to testify in a court without being asked to do so? Give the detail on this matter.